Good morning. Boy, it's good to see you all. It's good to have this opportunity to be here. It is my privilege to uh, come every other year and to have a King James Sunday that's to be a reminder about the King James Bible and why that's so important to this church. Uh, in the course of that, I sometimes find myself repeating things, and I've been encouraged not to worry about that. But this hour, you're going to get something absolutely new that you've never heard from me before. And at first, it may not sound like it fits a King James Sunday. It does. We're going to talk about the book of Enoch. The book of Enoch is everywhere. People talking about it. It's a book taken out of the Bible. It's a rage. People have all kinds of ideas from it. They're, they're doing this, that, and the other with it. And uh, it's generated all kinds of questions for people. It is all over the internet. And more people today get their news from the internet than anywhere else. They get their theology from the internet than anywhere else. They get their history from the internet than anywhere else. And so it creates just a great deal of stir and uh, a lot of questions about it. If you understand the basic issues we need to understand in dealing with the Bible and that end up causing us to be King James Bible believers, you would understand this. Go to the book of Jude with me. Have a copy of the book of Enoch, which is just so uh, discussed everywhere. And, and more people say things about it, I think, than have ever read it. But it is just a part of the nonstop discussion. And I say, well, but Enoch, and they'll say the book of Enoch is, is mentioned in the Bible. In fact, many folks would try to suggest it is a canonical book of the Bible, a book that belongs in Scripture that has been taken out improperly. And, and they'll try to justify that by saying that the book of Enoch is in the Ethiopian Bible. Uh, and that it is uh, a, bi a book that was in the Bible, was in the Bible before the King James came along, and it got taken out. Let me say just right up front that the, just simply saying the book of Enix in the Ethiopian Bible is, is nowhere near an accurate representation of it. A segment of the Orthodox Church in Ethiopia has a Bible with the book of Enoch in it. A Jewish group in Ethiopia, has a Bible with the book of Enoch in it. This is the only two groups in the world that have ever included Enoch as being part of Scripture. Okay. It's not common. It is not everybody in Ethiopia. It's not everybody uh, using an, an Ethiopian Bible. I had the privilege for many years of pastoring a considerable group of Ethiopian people. And when I pastored in inner city, Chicago, we ended up at a point with about 150 Ethiopian people in the church, a separate Ethiopian service. For many years, I was considered the Ethiopian pastor. There's actually an African pastors fellowship that meets once a month in, in Chicago. And Rwandan church, church from Ghana, all, all the different churches. And I was the Ethiopian pastor. I looked a little different than the rest of the African pastors in the African Pastors Fellowship. And, and they weren't uh, necessarily all churches that I was very close to doctrinally. I just got a kick out of being thought of as an African pastor. I just went because, you know, that was not something I'd ever anticipated in my life that I would ever be able to put that on my resume that I was an African pastor. But we had wonderful, wonderful experiences with our Ethiopian folks. Today, they're an independent church in Chicago, and I have the privilege of preaching for them the Sunday before Christmas every year, and it is a special time uh, for me. But uh, they did not use an Ethiopian Bible that had the Book of Enoch in it. There is a segment in the Orthodox Church of Ethiopia that does, and there is one of several Jewish groups in Ethiopia. There's one Jewish group that has the Book of Enoch. But people are all excited about this and all the kind of doctrines are supposed to come from it. And they love going to the book of Jude. So we'll pick up in Jude verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, 
and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts. Their mouths speak with great swelling words, having men's person in admiration because of advantage. People say, see, there's the book of Enoch. That's obviously, ab absolutely not to. doesn't say anything about a book of Enoch. It does see, say that Enoch prophesied. There, a Bible in the Old Testament is full of the stories of prophets. These were men who routinely delivered prophetic messages by the inspiration of the Lord, and those messages were not written down for us. We have no idea what most of those folks said in this particular case. And, and I think we would find out if we had everything that Old Testament saints probably knew a whole lot more than we think they did. In this particular case, all these years back, Enoch, seventh from Adam, prophesied of the rapture of the church. He's coming. Thousands of his saints. And, and there it is. And it's just an incredible thing. But there's no book there. Now, no doubt God gave prophecy that we don't know anything about through lots of Old Testament characters. The Bible tells us on two different occasions that King Saul laid on the ground all day long and prophesied all day. We do not know what he prophesied. It'd be interesting to know. It, it would satisfy our curiosity, but we do not know. And God has not chosen to tell us because we did not eat, need that information. Go back to me, Genesis chapter 5. The folks who are fond of this book are, are like to talk a lot about things they have learned from the book of Enoch and, and make a big issue out of it. And again, say that it corresponds with Scripture and there's lots of things to be learned according to them. There are a lot of things to be learned about all this and, and they, they'll, they'll address it a lot. And uh, they'll say, this is one of the lost books of, of the Bible and it's important that we get it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and they, they want to teach a lot. I have been part of a lot of unusual programs. I have a simple policy. I will basically speak anywhere or on any program as long as the end of the program, I get to give the gospel. I have been in some unusual settings. And it's basically call me and, and I'll speak. We have to have this understanding. I give the gospel at the end. So I got a call to be on this program, uh, a radio station, radio station out in California, an unusual guy. He wanted to talk about current events. And he was one of the people into this and the Nephilim. Only he had a little different angle on it. He believed there were gray Nephilim and green Nephilim. And the Nephilim, that's a word that means giants, and that is a reference to the giants in the book of uh, Genesis. And um, there were supposed to be lessons from them all, except that he, to him it was very important that, you know, the green Nephilim were good and the gray Nephilim were bad. And so he made a great deal out of it. And I, I'd just be there on the phone on the radio and I'd let, listen to him and <clears throat> said very little and throw in a comment every now and then. And we got the last five minutes, I'd give the gospel. I didn't figure after the first program he'd ever want to talk to me again, but he seemed to like having somebody that didn't talk much. So he had me on a second time and a third time. And you might say I learned a lot. I got to give the gospel three different times. Who knows who was listening? But I, have, I just had a, a suspicion they weren't people who got to hear the gospel very often. So that's my background with all this. When you get to... Uh, Genesis chapter 5, you pick up in verse 18. And uh, there's a little bit of background. And Jared lived 162 years, and he begot Enoch. And Jared lived after he begat Enoch, 800 years, begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 960 and two years, and he died. And Enoch lived 60 and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah 300 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God. He was not, for God took him. And then it goes on after that to tell you the story of Methuselah. There was a real man named Enoch. He walked with God. 
he appears to be one of two people that has not yet died a natural death that were snatched up by God into eternity. Other being Elijah and, and this one being Enoch. And this is not the purpose of the message this morning. A lot of folks have wondered about that. Does the Bible say it not say it's appointed a man wants to die? It is interesting in the book of Revelation, there will be two witnesses who come down from heaven and will preach the gospel and will eventually be killed by the forces of the Antichrist. It is my guess that that is Enoch and Elijah because it's appointed and everybody wants to die. They have not died yet. I'm, I'm not making a big deal out of that. That's not the real point of the message today. But here's the argument that people want to make. Enoch was a real character from antiquity. The book of Enoch was, is old. You have it being used in Ethiopia hundreds of years ago. And so it must be, it's old. It's about a Bible character. So it must be thought of as scripture and it must be thought of as revelation. And so we, we need to consider it as divine and from God. Well, it is certainly old. It is certainly about a real character. That is not what creates a book of the Bible. Fairly famous fellow named Bart Ehrman. He used to be out of Duke University. I understand he's a professor in, in England now. He wrote a couple of books on the lost books of the Bible, and he wants to refer back to books that, that are old. Some of them go back to close to the time of Christ, there are books that claim to be scripture. And he said, we should have kept them in the scripture. They should be in the canon. They should be in the Bible because they're old and they're about biblical characters. And a lot of people get excited about them. You can purchase them, uh, 82 books uh, with an introduction by Bart Ehrman. And um, let me say, I have read them all and I deserve some kind of an award for having put myself through that. And... Um, there's no great reason to be excited about them. They, they teach a lot of unusual things. One of my favorites, they all claim to have been written by Bible characters and um, to teach divine truth. One of my favorites teaches that women cannot be saved, only men. My guess now, supposedly, that was the Apostle Thomas that wrote that. My guess, it was really somebody that was in a bad mood, had had more than one bad experience, and felt like saying something unkind about women. And so he attached Thomas's name to it so people would think it was Scripture. You have to understand there's a 300-year period before people had the books of the New Testament all together, God was giving scripture. You, you, the Galatians have a book. The Philippians have a book. The Ephesians have a book. But in that early New Testament era, the believers did not have all the books God had given. And one of their challenges, one of their interest was finding everything God had given and collecting it. Can you imagine how exciting that would be, by the way? Say you're in the church at Ephesus. You have the Old Testament and the book of Ephesians. And the book of Ephesians is testifying in your heart. It got sent to your church, and that's where it was first. And then you hear, over in Philippi, they have another book that came from God. And so you want to get a copy of it. And you hear, well, well uh, somebody wrote a book to the Hebrews. And th then there, there's the book of 1 Corinthians. Boy, you want to read that one, man. Does it straighten that church out? And they had a process of collecting the books of the New Testament. While they were collecting the books of the New Testament, false teachers were trying to get a chance to teach what they wanted to teach, and they were making things up, and they were pretending that what they had written had come in the name of Philip or Peter or Thomas or John or, or whoever. And all kinds of heretics were putting, presenting books as if they were scripture. It was their way of teaching what they wanted to teach. It was their way of making themselves look important. Look, I've got one of the books of scripture. You ought to listen to me. 
And, and so it was a common thing. It was one of the challenges of the early church was recognizing the books of Scripture. Now, that challenge goes on for about 300 years, and people begin to talk about the canon. The canon was the rule. They meant it in terms of Scripture. It's the list of books that God gave. And, and, and by the 300s, everybody is pretty uh, equally convinced these are the books of the New Testament, and they have rejected all these other books. Bart Ehrman, Ehrman and others would say, why reject those books? They're old. They're about spiritual subjects. There are interesting stories in them, and there are. But when people ask me about that, I ask them why they do not accept Superman, Batman, and Spider-Man comic books as being part of the Scripture. And the answer is because nobody really believes those things happened. Okay. Yes, people wrote these books, and these particular books were old. They're about Bible characters, but folks didn't believe them. Here and there, somebody would fall for something, get confused about a book. One of my favorites is the Epistle of Barnabas, which says in chapter 1, verse 6, this is not Scripture. It's as clear as it could be. And, and whoever wrote it, maybe the real biblical Barnabas, didn't want anybody to mistake it for Scripture. So he says right in the introduction, this is not Scripture, and you should not think it's Scripture. To me, that's pretty clear. Some people here and there thought this is really from Barnabas, and they listed it as part of the Bible. Okay? It was obvious it wasn't. Some folks have said, well, the Catholic Church established the canon. It did not. God's people did. You could tell when you read a book of Scripture, it worked in your heart, it drew you to God, it taught you things, it accomplished things. People knew and people in general said, that's not the Bible, that's not the Bible. But in general, they agreed, this is the Bible, God uses it in my heart. And during those years, vast majority of people in Europe, in the Mideast, in North Africa, read the book Enoch. I said, that, that's obviously not scripture. Except for a small number of people in Ethiopia is widely rejected by everybody else. When you understand this and you understand the issue of canonicity, you understand there's a fixed number of books that God gave, and that's very important to us. Okay? Same issues. When you get to the Apocrypha, why we do not accept those books that the Catholic Church added uh, to Scripture and considered a Scripture, they did not work in God's heart. They did not testify to God's people. And the, the understanding of what is and what isn't Bible came from the hearts of God's people. Well, if, if you're looking at the book of Enoch, it tells you all these stories about demons, Nephilim, giants. And according to the book of Enoch, the giants are the product of demons impregnating human women. And, and that produced these giants. And their ungodliness is what led to the flood. And then there's the implication that these Nephilim still exist today, and they are the agents of the devil that are causing so much trouble and distress today. So as I mentioned, the one guy that, did, that I did interviews with believed there were good Nephilim and bad Nephilim. It's very important you keep them straight because the good ones were green and the bad ones were gray. And, and so I've been on the look ever since. And if I ever saw a green Nephilim, I would be polite to him. And the gray ones are to be avoided. That was what the guy said. The whole thing obviously is false and foolish because this is not where uh, the giants came from. If you look in, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 1, it says, It came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, they were fair, and they took them wives of all that they chose. So, so what happened? You had two lines of people on the earth, even early. You had the descendants of Seth, you had the descendants of Cain who lived in rebellion against God. And that phrase, sons of God, 
has at times in Scripture been used of angels, but is also often used in reference to people who knew the Lord. I would feel perfectly comfortable calling you folks the sons of God, you saved folks that are here. It is a Bible term. And here was the challenge that led to so much ungodliness. Unsaved men got attracted to saved godly women, and they began intermarrying. This shouldn't be a shock, and we should be smarter than this. In fact, ungodly men often really like the idea of having a godly wife. There are advantages to having a godly wife, even if you're an ungodly man. And it's one of these principles, that you've been in ministry as long as I have, 51 years, you have watched this over and over again. You watch it with heartbreak. Uh, some ungodly man will become attracted to a godly woman. Usually we're talking about folks in their youth, but an ungodly man will become attracted to a godly woman, flatter her, offer her things, uh, approach her in a way that makes her feel secure and, and will persuade her to become his romantic partner, his wife. I cannot list the number of disasters I have seen that comes from this. Folks should know better. People should understand. And I, I've preached this for years. I preach this to young people. I preach this to the young ladies. I said, man, you have a dream of marrying a godly man. Only date godly young men. Only hang around with godly young men. Only spend time with godly young men if one day you want to marry a godly man and have the kind of home that comes from having a godly husband in it. Now, you don't have to look very far to find stories of folks who have married out of the will of God, thinking everything was going to work out well and that it would be great, and it turns out to be a disaster. I was in church recently, and there's a young couple in that church that I used to pastor in Chicago, and I pastored the young lady from the time she was in, in a junior high through high school and beyond. I did not know the young couple was in that church, had, that they had moved, and I came in that morning, and I, was, I saw them, I was surprised, and um, see them there, and we're visiting, and the pastor said, yeah, thank you for sending this young couple to me, they have been wonderful. I said, I didn't send them to you. I didn't even know they were here. He said, well, they came in one Sunday morning. They came half an hour early and introduced themselves and said they wanted to join our church. He said, normally we do not get that as the introduction when visitors come in and introduce them. But he said, they, they said, this is a church Brother, Str Brother Stringer preaches at. That's right. He said, well, yes. And they said, well, that's what we want to join the church Brother Stringer preaches at told them they'd been under my pastorate. And they said they joined quickly. They went to work. They were serving the Lord. They were doing wonderful. And uh, I was happy to see them. And a young lady came from a home where she had several sisters who married ungodly men or were involved with ungodly men and had lived with the trauma of that in their lives. But she'd married a godly young man. And she told me, as I was preaching that meeting, she told me one night, she said, I want to thank you. She said, you were preaching to us and you said, you want to live in a godly home? Only date godly young men. Only hang around with godly young men. Only spend time with godly young men. And she said, I never told you. But she said, when you said that, I made that decision sitting there that day. That's exactly what I was going to do. And she did. And she married a godly young man and has had a life that is different than her siblings. Well, that's the issue here. And verse 3, And the Lord says, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he also is flesh, yet his days should be 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And it goes on to tell you about the flood. Well, the story in the book of Enoch that folks like to jump onto is that this is what caused the wickedness in the earth is that 
um, demons, impregnated human women, and they created this hybrid race, half angel, half human, and they were wicked and ungodly, and that corrupted the earth and led to the flood, and that those are the folks that are causing all the earth's problems today. Well, there's a whole bunch of problems with that. Number one, the giants were there before this happened. Secondly, the flood destroyed all of the ungodly at that time. If that was true, and there was such a race, I don't believe there was, but if it was true, the flood would have destroyed them. And thirdly, spiritual beings and human beings cannot produce offspring. None of that's true. But folks have built this whole thing off it. And some of them are saying, oh, I can recognize someone that has Nephilim blood in them. And the Nephilim are the great conspiracy that causes our political leaders to do such terrible and ridiculous things. And the Nephilim are behind all the crime. And the Nephilim are behind the drug cartels. And the Nephilim are this and the Nephilim are that. And the truth is, none of that is true. This is a story somebody made up in the name of a Bible character, claimed to have been written by a Bible character, and a story made up that explains to everybody, people like to come up with explanations for where all our sin problems come from. Okay? Well, first of all, when you understand the canon of Scripture, you understand this book of Enoch was never in the Bible. It hasn't been removed from the Bible. That's always the way it's advertised and promote. You want to see the book removed from the Bible, it was never in the Bible to be removed from it. A handful of people in Ethiopia made a mistake with it. Country after country, and most of the people in Ethiopia never made that mistake. Country after country, group of people after group of people looked at this uh, among all the other books that were being rejected. And just like they rejected the ridiculous Gospel of Thomas that says women cannot be saved, they rejected the book of Enoch. It was never in Scripture. It teaches this concept of secret knowledge. And there's some people that have secret knowledge, and so they are the ones who can know what's really going on. Boy, isn't that a nice thought? You can be the really smart ones, the really spiritual ones. You know what everybody else doesn't know. That is a basic weakness of man, that we like to think of ourselves that way. And interestingly enough, all the people that believe that, that there's some folks that have secret knowledge, think they're the ones that have the secret knowledge. You all understand this, anybody can claim anything. People always trying to put a spiritual cover on their own false teachings. And that's what somebody did with Enoch. And amazingly enough, after all these years, it has popped up. It's very popular. It's all over YouTube. Some of the stories about it have got millions of viewers. And um, during the pandemic, everything on YouTube, on the Internet, podcasts, got multiplied and multiplied in its influence when for two years we weren't going anywhere or doing anything. And often we're not even having church services. Supposedly, this tells about Enoch's experiences with fallen angels, how he blew new divine secrets, and all of that kind of thing. However, it's very clearly not Scripture. It describes a Messiah and says the Messiah is a spirit, not a human being, and a specially chosen spirit. In other words, it's completely wrong about Christ. And the ultimate test in the Bible, 1 John 4, of spiritual teaching is what does this spirit say about Christ? Book of Enoch fails that test. Not only that, the book of Enoch has a plan of salvation. It's a plan of salvation. You have to become perfect. Be accepted by God. And it'll, of course, tell you how to be perfect. But aren't you glad that's not the plan of salvation? Boy, that'd be downright scary, wouldn't it, if that was a plan of salvation? I have to be. You know, there's lots of people who believe that. God bless them. Isn't it wonderful when somebody tells them about the gospel of grace and how it is that you can find Christ as your Savior? I am accepted by God because of what Jesus did for me. Far cry, not because I'm perfect. It talks about the watchers. 
special satanic inspired demons that are responsible for all the, the political errors that exist in our world today. So if there's a political party or candidate or a movement you don't like, it's all the fault of the watchers who are sent by the Nephilim, and you know that because of the Book of Enoch. Glory to God. See, there are people that believe this. This is enormously popular. You know who doesn't believe it? King James Bible believers. We already know we had an authoritative Bible before this came along. We knew why the books that are in our Bible are the books that are in our Bible. We understand we've had a heritage. People are always looking for something new to make things real or lively or good or better or all that. We didn't have to have something new. We had an authoritative Bible before the latest internet program came along. We know who Jesus is because it's crystal clear in our Bible. Some of the folks fallen for this have very corrupt Bibles and the identity of Jesus is not clear in them. I know this will sound bizarre, but um, I got asked once in Chicago to speak at a UFO gathering. Okay, you know I explained earlier, I speak at anything if I get to give the gospel at the end. And they wanted me to speak about UFOs in the Bible. I think they were a little disappointed with my presentation. They wanted me to go to Ezekiel chapter 1 and explain how it was a flying saucer and all that kind of thing. And I went to Ezekiel chapter 1 and explained how chapter 10 says that's a vision of the cherubim. And it has absolutely nothing to do with flying saucers. And you can do an explanation of flying saucers and aliens in the Bible very quickly. There aren't any. So what I did since I'd been asked to speak at the flying saucer thing, uh, UFO thing, was I went through the places in the Bible that people claim are flying saucers and made it clear they weren't. And then at the end, I gave the gospel, which is not something they were expecting, I think. I've never been invited back. And, and, and frankly, it was one of the weirdest days of my life. I, I haven't really missed not going back. People are always looking for something new because they don't have an authoritative Bible. And some of the folks at that UFO convention considered themselves Christians. Some of them had Bibles. Some of them carried Bibles. But they would want to argue with you that Jesus was not God. And they'd want to go in their Bibles to argue with you that Jesus was not God. And in the Bibles they were carrying, you had some loopholes. You had some wiggle room. You could try and make a case. They, they, they loved to go to Genesis 3.25 and say that Nebuchadnezzar saw a son of the gods in the fire, and that son of the gods was a, a being from a flying saucer. Because in their Bible, he's a son of the gods. In our Bible, he's the son of God. He's the angel of the Lord. He's the son of God. He's the savior. And here's the whole point. Say, why are people falling for this? The same reason they're falling for so such a wide spectrum of so many different ideas that clamor for people's attention today. Because... They don't have an authoritative Bible. An authoritative Bible will answer a lot of questions. It'll solve a lot of problems. It'll make a lot of differences. It'll change a lot of things if you have an authoritative Bible. If you don't have an authoritative Bible, you've got all kinds of wiggle room. You've got all kinds of loopholes. You got all kinds of questions you don't know how to answer. Would you go with me to Revelation chapter 22? 
Okay, interesting. You get to the last message of the Bible. It mentions three things. Interestingly enough, they are probably the three biggest debates in our churches today. Happen to be the three things the Lord mentions in the very last message of the Bible. Revelation 22, verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that heareth say, come. Let him that is a thirst, come. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Uh, biggest debate sweeping our churches today is the debate over Calvinism. Did God, Christ die for all men or some? You want to know what the message of the Spirit is? Whosoever will. Um, and one of the big cries of the Calvinist cried, they say, well, you can only get saved if the Holy Spirit calls you. Okay, want to know who he calls? It tells you right there. Whosoever will. You're absolutely right. You can't get saved if the Holy Spirit, unless the Holy Spirit calls you. Aren't you glad to know he's calling everybody? And then, if you jump to verse 20, the third one says, He which testify these things saith, Surely I come quickly. We should be looking for the return of the Lord. Big debate today. People try to say, Jesus is not coming back in any sense. There's no rapture till after the tribulation. We should be looking for the tribulation. But again and again, the Bible tells us to look for the Lord, not the tribulation. Hallelujah. I, I, I for one, am really glad. Okay. It's not only what I believe the doctrine is. I'm really glad that's the doctrine. But in the middle, verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city from things which are written in this book. Good Christians will debate a great deal what this means and what the punishments are for somebody that takes the words out of the book. Now, personally, I think the punishment is a reference to blessings in the millennium and that people that fool with the Bible are going to lose some of the blessings that other folks have in the millennium. Now, good folks differ. That's not the subject for this morning. Here's, here's the thing I'm sure of. You better be awful careful with the words of God. We have an authoritative Bible. There is a price tag for not recognizing that we have an authoritative Bible. There is a price tag for thinking that the words are yours to change as you will. You have people dealing with Scripture and they say, well, a translation I like is such and such. Did you know there's some very clear, plain statements in the Bible that I don't like at all? Don't misunderstand me. I'm not questioning whether or not they're true. I'm questioning how spiritual I am. Bible tells me to forgive everyone that wrongs me. I, I don't always like that. Maybe you're so spiritual it's never been a problem. I've had some moments where I'm thinking maybe if I could find it in another translation where it said it differently, I could feel better. The fact is, God did not ask me what I thought. The words of God are the absolute authority. The Bible teaches us men about our wives to love them and never be bitter against them, ever. And you may have such a wonderful, sweet wife that there's never been a moment that she upset you at all. I have a very interesting, wonderful, sweet wife who's an amazing Christian lady, 23 and a half hours a day. The first 30 minutes she's awake, you do not recognize her. I did not know this before we got married. We'd never woken up together before we got married. 
and in, she has the hardest time of transitioning into being awake of anybody I know. And, and during the years, and she really is the sweetest person you know, 23 and a half hours today, a day, she had said some things to me during the first half hour of the day that I can't believe she even knew to say. I, I did develop a, a cure for this entire problem. I have my devotions every morning, the first half hour she's awake. I'm off in, in my room having my devotions and it works out great. But before I figure that out, she, she has what I call the slice and dice look where she can just look at you and cut you into pieces. I've really never seen it except the first few minutes of the morning. But she has it. I remember one time she gave that look to, to one of the TSA people at the airport. And I remember saying to my son, this is going to take a while because they had her off, giving her all kinds of difficulty. And I tried to explain to her, those people know they have your life in their hands. You just have to smile and, and be polite no matter what. There might have been a moment or two that I might have wanted to have been upset with my wife. And the word of God forbids it. I'm just telling you, every now and then, the words of Scripture don't say what I want them to say. Those moments, I would like for them to say, you tell her how things really are. You set her straight. Let her know how loud you can be. I've, I've tried all that, by the way, and it doesn't work. You men probably knew that already. We don't fool with the words of God. It's what God said. We have an authoritative Bible. People with an authoritative Bible don't care what the book of Enoch on the internet says. They don't care what the latest YouTube special about the book of Enoch tells us. We have an authoritative Bible that we get our doctrine from. Y'all got it? You have a standard by which you can handle everything that comes in the issues of the day, everything that comes in your personal life. By the way, I'm not sure my wife has always rejoiced in, in those lines in Scripture about being submissive to your husband. Might have even been a moment or two that she thought I wasn't worthy of that because all men tend to be idiots. And there might have even been in 50 years together one or two such moments, not many, but might have been one or two such moments in my life. But we have an authoritative Bible. When you have an authoritative Bible, you can handle everything that comes.